The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. When you come right down to it, there are three mysteries we experience which have much in common. The mystery of dreams, the mystery of hope, and the mystery of evoking imagination. Mystery theater best fulfills the last one, but it is the first two enigmas we will explore today. Hope, the fantasy of our waking hours, and dreams, those visions of both night and day to make our lives more bearable. Our mystery drama, Tomorrow is Never, was adapted from a story by Henry James by James Agate Jr., especially for the Mystery Theater, and stars Marion Seldes and Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Her name was Caroline Spencer. Caroline teaches school, and sometimes her fourth-grade students would wink and make fun of her. For Caroline might suddenly be gazing out the window of her classroom, looking far beyond the snow-covered New England hills, daydreaming of Rome or Paris, places she'd never seen. Today, at a party, she will meet Lawrence Stanford, a man who may change her whole life. Aunt Peg, thanks for inviting me over. Oh, Lawrence Stanford, don't stand in the doorway. Come in or it'll be snowing in my hall. Oh, right. First, let me thaw out. It's cold out there. Hmm. Take your coat off. I will, I will. Be patient with me. Oh, I'm glad you braved the storm to come to my party. People are so rude. Hardly anyone has arrived yet. You'd think they'd have the decency to let me know. Oh, no, Aunt Peg, are you being fair? The drifts are three feet high. Not everyone is used to climbing the Alps like I am. Vermont is nothing compared to that. Well, so it's snowy. You'd think they'd find some other means of letting me know. <sighs> I see you've brought along your album of photographs, as I asked you to. I am just the person for you who will be fascinated. Oh, I don't mind showing my pictures in the slightest. That way I don't have to be witty or charming or even talk. Evidence of my travels. Talk for me. Well, stop talking now and join us in the parlor. Oh, Caroline. Yes, Mrs. Pegasus. May I introduce you to Lawrence Stanford? Lawrence, this is Caroline Spencer. Lawrence is my nephew and my neighbor when he isn't gallivanting about the world. How do you do, Mr. Stanford? A pleasure. Now, I have a special purpose in mind, introducing you to... Lawrence, young as he is, is a world traveler. Oh, how wonderful. There, you see, Lawrence? Here is a young lady to whom traveling is the ne plus ultra. Well, as Paganini said to the King of Prussia only yesterday, I just happened to bring my violin. <laughs> oh, stop <laughs> fooling, Lawrence. What my nephew means is that he brought a whole portfolio of pictures of the places he's been to. Oh, I understood that. Oh, did you? Aunt Peg, I think I hear someone at the door. Good. <laughs> Hopefully someone else has braved the storm to join us. Miss Spencer... Whether you're ready for it or not, and whether I am or not, it's travel time for both of us. Let's sit over here by the fire. Now, on this page, uh, some pictures I took in Switzerland. Uh, you sure I'm not boring you? We've already been through half my photographs. Oh, no, not a bit. I'm quite fascinated. Please go... Oh... Oh, that lake is like glass. Mm. Have you been on the shore, too? That big building? Oh, that's the castle of Chalon on Lake Geneva. Yes, many times. Chalon. Isn't that where Bonavard was imprisoned? Byron wrote about it in The Prisoner of Chalon. You're quite right. Uh, that one picture brings back Byron and his poetry. Oh, yes. And more. I see. Well, if you can understand how art and literature and music are all part of European life, I'd say that... You are well equipped to visit many countries, Switzerland, Italy, everywhere. 
But if you want to see Europe as Byron described it, you'd better make your trip soon. The continent is getting sadly dis-Byronized. How soon must I go? I'd uh, give you ten years. Oh, I think I can go in that time. <laughs> Well, you two have been sitting by the fire for an hour. Don't you want some tea? Can I get you a cup, Miss Spencer? Oh, thank you, yes. Just plain, no sugar or milk. Plain, no sugar, no milk. Cakes? And, Lawrence, come back here. I'll bring you both some tea. Are you sure, Aunt Peg? Besides, I may be taking up too much of Miss Spencer's time. <laughs> Why do you think I invited you here? Now, put that portfolio back in your lap, and I'll bring you both a cup. Mrs. Pegasus is a sweet lady. Yes, how do you know my aunt? Well, three of her little grandnieces are in my English class. Oh, oh, so that's what you do. You teach English. Well, with half a mind, really. Do you speak many languages? Well, after fashion, but well enough to make myself understood from Geneva to Rome. I envy you. Have you been over there many years? Well, it does mount up. Put all the visits together. And you've traveled everywhere. Oh, no, not everywhere. I... I love it, and happily I can indulge. All of this is like a fairy tale to me. I suppose it's all very expensive, isn't it? Europe? Well, depends how you go. Uh, the big ocean liners, they're expensive, but one can go third class. It takes no more than two weeks. Once you're over there, you can manage with very little. You can see a great deal if you spend it wisely. Well, I think I could. I've saved and saved, and I'm always adding a little bit to it. And I don't mind doing without things as long as... Oh, well, <laughs> there's that pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. Those countries, their history. You must never give up that dream, Caroline. When your rainbow ends in such beautiful colors. You say that in such a kind way. I don't even mind your calling me by my first name. And yet we hardly know each other. Well, I didn't mean to be forward. My friends call me Larry. Oh, it's all right. I feel I can trust you. It hasn't been only saving up the money to go. It's been other things. I'm almost afraid to talk about it anymore. Two or three times, it's come a little nearer, and I start making definite plans, and then I talk about it, and it melts away. <laughs> I can't explain it, but I'm still possessed with a kind of madness to travel. Well, there's only one cure for it, and that... Is to make up one's mind and go. Keep believing, and you will. I've read and read. I've prepared my mind, I think, as well as anyone can. Not just Byron, but, but histories and guidebooks, Bedeckers. Mm -hmm. And when I'm at long last there, when I put my foot on that ground, <laughs> I know I shall rave about everything. Well, as I say, <laughs> the only cure is to go. Indulge in yourself. I've got a relative who lives in Paris. He's an art student. So it isn't as though I'd be completely alone. Yes, well, I'll be going back pretty soon. One has to. And I'll be looking for you, Caroline, and I'll expect to find you there. Well, here you are, you two. <laughs> two cups of tea. Lawrence, I believe it stopped snowing. Well, my dear, meeting this young man is almost like an adventure with an explorer, isn't it? Oh, Mrs. Pegasus, you couldn't have given me a more enjoyable afternoon. I do appreciate it. Miss Spencer... Caroline, I'd, uh, I'd better circulate a bit or they'll accuse my aunt of inviting a very rude nephew. But if you do go abroad, remember, I shall be on the lookout for you. And I'll tell you if I'm disappointed. That was how I met Caroline Spencer. Almost three years went by. I was living in Paris... And in October, I'd gone to the French port, Le Havre, to meet my brother, Freddy, and his wife. I got there late. Their ship had already docked, and I finally found them at the Grand Hotel. Larry, how good to see you. You never get any older. <laughs> you wondered what happened to you. The train was late leaving the Gare saint Lazare, and then every farmer in northern France took it into his head to drive his cows across the tracks just as our boat train wanted to pass. <laughs> How is Elizabeth? Oh, not well at all. Not a good start to a vacation. Oh, what is it? Oh, you know, still feels the boat under her. <laughs> She's in the next room now trying to sleep. Well, aren't we taking the 4.30 back to Paris? It's unlikely, Larry. Better to spend the night here and when Elizabeth's had a good sleep to start off fresh tomorrow. Ah, but we'll see. Well, if, uh, 
If that's the case, Freddy, the first thing to do is for you and me to find ourselves a cafe on the waterfront and have a spot of cognac. At two in the afternoon, cognac? Freddy, my boy, you are in France, and when you get to Rome, I expect you'll do as the Romans do. But till you get there, while you're here, you'll do as the French do. Cognac at two. Cheers. To your health, too, Larry. Oh, and to Elizabeth's. Mm. Hope she's back on her feet by dinner time. Mm. Good cognac, I'll say that for it. And cheap. Great Scott. Hmm? There she is. The little lady of the steamer. Hmm? Oh, you mean that girl at the farthest table under the awning? Was she on your boat? On deck from morning till night. She's never sick. And I needn't tell you how rough the Atlantic can be in October. You know, every day she'd sit there, just as she's doing now, hands folded, looking out at the horizon ahead every single day, as though hypnotized. Well, why don't you go speak to her? Oh, I don't know her. We never met. She talked to no one. You know, I have an idea. She's a, a Yankee schoolmistress on her first trip to Europe. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. I think I'll speak to her. Oh, I wouldn't, Larry. She's very shy. Freddie, Freddie, I know her. I'm sure I met her at a tea party at Aunt Pay's. Oh, well, matter of fact, I'm getting twinges of conscience about Elizabeth. I'll be starting back to the hotel. Well, I'll walk you back. No, oh, no, it's just up the road. I can find it. Suppose you come knock at our door about six, and we'll see if she's well enough for us all to go down and have an early dinner. Good afternoon. I beg your pardon? You Do you did. mind uh, if I sit with you at your table? So, so, here you are in Europe. I hope you're not disappointed. <laughs> it was you who showed me photographs of your travels. You're Mrs. Pegasus' nephew. I remember that afternoon so very well. Yes, so do I. So do I, Caroline. The last thing you said to me was, I'll tell you if I'm disappointed. And you're not. Oh, I can't begin to tell you how happy I am just to be sitting here in this cafe watching the people. It's, it's like a dream. I've been right here for over an hour, and I don't want to move. Well, if you're that enchanted with poor, prosaic Le Havre, you'll have no admiration left for better things. There are so many, so many more beautiful places just waiting for you. And why are you still in Le Havre anyway? Why haven't you gone on to Paris? It's quite a long story. It's because of my cousin, George. You see, he has all my money. It happens. There seems to be no end of naivete, of trusting people who believe the best of others. Caroline Spencer seems to be one of those, but not so Larry Stanford who is beginning to feel compassion, if not care and conscience, for this neophyte innocent traveler. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I won't be as brash as that Broadway figure who once said, there's a sucker born every minute. But when Larry Stanford heard the young school teacher had handed over all her savings for a European trip to a mysterious cousin, he was apprehensive. He would have been downright appalled had he been able to overhear Cousin George two weeks before Cousin Caroline arrived. There is no other way. But, George, I don't think I can do it. My handwriting is terrible. Uh, Bertha, it will be good enough for this. I am supposed to be a French countess? Oh, if anyone can understand my handwriting, they would never believe it. I tell you, Bertha, it doesn't matter. She won't know the difference. Now, I've given you some nice, clean paper. There is the ink. Take up the pen and we'll begin. But, Georges, chérie, why am I writing this letter? If your cousin... This Mademoiselle Caroline from America arrives at La Havre in two weeks. Why write her a letter? She won't receive it before her departure. Because, ma petite, I shall go to meet the ship when it arrives. And when I think the moment is right, I will give it to her to read. Now, write. Cher Mademoiselle, hmm? I appeal to you 
As one woman to another. Woman to another. Mm, new sentence. Huh? Your wonderful cousin George. Oh, you don't think much of yourself, do you? Bertha, will you stop this nonsense and write what I tell you? Look, I don't know whether my cousin is rich or not, whatever. She's certainly better off than we are. All I'm asking is to borrow some money until my chef d'oeuvre, my big painting, is completed. Now, does that satisfy you? Then why this, uh, I appeal from one woman to another? What are you up to, Georges? I want to know. I have a right. We are husband and wife, aren't we? You don't trust me. And why do I have to be a countess? I work in a bakery shop in my spare time. That's honest work, isn't it? <laughs> you don't understand the romantic mentality of an American spinster. Now, shall we continue? When Caroline told me she'd handed her American dollars over to her cousin, I admit I was more than suspicious. I became alarmed. I can't say why, but it gave me a definite chill. And I suppose I looked uneasy as we sat together at that waterfront cafe. What a face you're making, Larry Stanford. It's all right. I hope so, Caroline. Then stop frowning. No, I'm wincing at the thought that half an hour after you land in Europe, your funds should have passed into someone else's hands. Is this cousin... George? George. Is he, uh... Is he going to travel with you? Only as far as Paris. He's an art student. Yes, you told me that. He was an art student three years ago. I've always thought that so splendid. I wrote to him when I was sailing, but I never expected him to come all the way here to love. I mean, that's very kind of him, don't you think? Hmm. He's very kind and very bright. Yes. But you say he has your money. Where did he go? He was to the bank to change some of my dollars. He said I should wait for him here. I haven't minded it a bit. I see. And when Cousin George returns, are you going to Paris? Well, George thinks I should stay here for a few days. Here? Poor man. Why do you say that? Well, something's troubling him. He said when he came back with my French money, he'd have something important to tell me. And that we shouldn't really decide anything until he's told it to me. Ah, I thought so. He's been so thoughtful, so how can I not listen to him? Caroline... You did not come all this distance to listen to troubles, but to go to new places. Oh, I will, I will. I have it all planned. Oh, that, that's him. Is hmm? he coming back? The oh. tall one? Yeah, the one with the swagger stick and the red hair. And the velvet jacket. Don't you just love the velvet jacket? And the slouch hat. That's my cousin. I told you we'd be along. George, over here. How do you do? I'm Lawrence Stanford. I'm an old friend of Caroline's. Hello. Oh, you were on the ship with her. Don't stand there, George. Sit down. Uh, he's got my chair. Well, fetch another one, silly. Larry, please stay. Uh, no, no. I, I think I'd better be off. My sister-in-law didn't make the voyage too well, and I want to get back, see how she is. Well, I was hoping to stand us all to a drink. Well, I'm afraid I haven't the time, but thank you. Caroline, in case I don't return to Paris this evening with my brother and sister-in-law, where are you staying here? I've put her into La Belle Normande. Isn't that a pretty name? It's a lovely old inn. Yes, it's a good place. I've been there myself. I know my way around, old chap. Au revoir. Caroline. Caroline, it's Larry. May I sit here? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you may, if you wish. <sighs> Beautiful evening, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my brother and his wife have decided to spend the night, and we'll all go to Paris tomorrow. So I thought I'd come over to La Belle Normande and see if you were still here. Oh, uh, I'm still here. Have you been crying? Me? Yes. Yes, I thought something was wrong. You're sitting here in the dark. Lots of stars in the sky. Caroline, tell me what happened. Oh, how can you tell? By the way, you've gathered yourself together as if you'd been hit and were trying to ward off any more blows. Your cousin gave you bad news, isn't that it? Between the time I left you this afternoon and now. You've had a very bad time of it. No, 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 not I. It's George who's been having one. He has great worries and he asked me to... 
Oh, you won't be angry with me. Angry with you? No, never. He was in dreadful need of money. In want of yours, you mean? Oh, of any he could get. Uh, honorably, of course. Oh, of course, honorably. And mine was all that was available. And he has taken all of it from you. Well, I gave him what I had. Oh, great Scott, Caroline. Is that what you call his getting money honorably all you had? He's just badly in debt. Yes, no doubt he is, but... What was the rush to take yours? Well, I felt so much for him. I... Yes, so do I. I hope at least he's going to give it back to you very soon. Oh, yes, as soon as he can. And when will that be? When he's finished his great painting. Oh, Caroline, Caroline, you can't accept that. His, his great picture, he's an art student. Where is he now? He's in the dining room having his dinner. Why aren't you eating with him? Oh, I wasn't hungry. I wanted to be under the sky in this little courtyard... You do understand, Larry. Look at that beautiful little outside staircase and the fountain with a small statue. I have to stay out here as much as I can, soaking it all up, breathing it. Caroline, Caroline, listen Where to me. Where else in the world could you find such a place? I, I don't know what to say to you. You see romance everywhere, and this man, this... This cousin of yours. Caroline, you're too generous. He made the debts himself. He ought to pay for them himself. Oh, he's been foolish. George admits that. He told me everything. He threw himself on my charity. It's not only for him. It's for his wife, the poor young thing. Oh, so he has a poor young wife now. Well, he married two years ago. Secretly. Oh, why secretly? She was a countess. Oh, you sure of that? Yes, yeah, she's written me the most beautiful letter. Asking you, whom she's never seen, for money? Asking me for confidence and sympathy. She's been cruelly treated by her family for marrying George. He told me that she's a beautiful young widow of a high-born count. I want you to read her letter. She begins by saying she appeals to me, one woman to another. Caroline, I'd rather not read it. You see, they're going to have a baby. There's not enough money even to feed it. How could I refuse George? My dear Caroline, my concern is for you. I don't want you to be stripped of every dollar you've saved for this trip for such a, a rigmarole. But it's not a rigmarole. I mean, how could I enjoy Europe knowing George and the Countess are suffering? Oh, yes, the Countess. Look here, she signed it, Countess Berta. Mm -hmm. Oh, I shan't live any worse than I've lived. And besides, the next time I come... I'll go first to England to see Stratford, where Shakespeare lives. You speak of next time. What of this time? You're being used unfairly, Caroline. You've worked for that money. I don't know how many years. I'll be coming back. And I'll stay with George and the Countess. He said so. He insisted. And by that time, I'll have everything back that I loaned him. It's a loan, you know. You mean you're going home right away? Well, I've... I've nothing left for the tour... You gave it all up. Well, it's just a loan. George insisted on signing notes for all of it, every dollar, even though I told him we're family. How large an amount, Caroline? Well, I've kept enough to take me back. Please, Larry, don't feel sorry for me. It's absolutely unbelievable. This so-called art student has taken that poor teacher for every dime she brought with her to see Paris, Marseille, Florence, Rome. Hmm. It's pathetic. A trip she's had a heart set on for years. Now, this man has shattered her dream and made her feel sorry for him in the bargain. He's made her believe he was doing her a favor by accepting her savings. I tell you, I'm so angry, I don't know what to do. Hmm. By the way, how's Elizabeth? No. <laughs> Better. Yeah. After a good night's sleep, she'll be able to start for Paris tomorrow. Fred, I wish you could see this character. He wears a slouch hat, a black velvet jacket. Velvet, mind you, like a caricature of a Degas or a Cezanne. <laughs> Pretending to be an artist. He's nothing but a pretentious liar and a cheat. And you didn't tell him so. Well, how could I? The poor girl is enchanted with this faker. Well, let her keep her illusions. It's all she has left. And I'm not the one to break them. Um, what 
train shall we catch tomorrow? Oh, by the way, Elizabeth said to thank you, Larry. We've already taken up so much of your time. Freddie, if I hadn't come down to La Havre to meet you both this whole episode with the poor little school teacher, how oh, it's so tragic. I wouldn't have known about that. Larry, have you thought maybe you should... should do more than complain? You're right. You're right, Fred. Tomorrow morning, I'll go to where she's staying and make her accept a loan from me uh, just so she can do a tour. After all, we're related in a way. And Peg introduced us. Of all the times in my life to have overslept, this time was unforgivable. Not that our train for Paris was to leave till noon, but what were Carol and Spencer's plans? As I dashed through the crooked streets to La Belle Normande, one sound echoed my worst fears. Looking for my cousin, are you? Yes. Good morning, George. Is Caroline up yet? Oh, yes. Yeah, she's up all right. Nice little courtyard, this, don't you think? Has she had a breakfast? Oh, yes. We shared a few croissants and coffee. Is that right here? Oh, nice, mellow old place, don't you think? Uh, George, George, we can talk, talk about all that later, all right? Where is your cousin now? Oh, didn't I tell you? She went to the boat about seven this morning. I helped her with her suitcase, took Carolyn right up the gangplank. She's on board. You might be able to wave to her. If you go up the street, you'll see the ship pulling away. I was too late. I turned away, conscious of the tears starting up in my eyes. That poor, poor woman. The end of her rainbow had been some 19 hours in Europe. Describing his own technique, Henry James tells us, make the reader's general vision of evil intense enough and his own imagination, his own sympathy or horror will supply him with the particulars. Precisely our aims and ambitions here on Mystery Theater. Indeed, were he alive today, what fabulous, spine-tingling dramas could Henry James have written for us? I shall return shortly with Act Three. The anguish we suffer at time present lessens with time passing. So it was with Larry Stanford. For a long time, he did not forgive himself for having literally missed the boat and allowing circumstances to take over Caroline Spencer's life. But months went by, then years. I'm not saying he forgave himself, but he did forget. And then... Suddenly it all came back to me. Five years after that dreadful episode at Le Havre, I found myself back home in America. It was spring. Again, I was a guest at one of Aunt Peg's tea parties with the same alderman and his wife, a selectman, and a few teachers. But no Caroline. Well, doesn't my nephew look well? After five years' absence from his homeland? <laughs> when he hears all sorts of things about Americans abroad, the weather is disagreeable, the food unpleasant. Uh, 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 not the food, Aunt Peg. It couldn't be better. Well... While you're in this house, Lawrence, you'll just have to be satisfied with molasses cookies, angel cake, and my own Boston tea. Oh, I'm not criticizing things at home. Far from it. I hate to hear Americans who come to Europe and run down their own country. Well, I didn't think you remained long enough in one place to meet many Americans, Lawrence. Uh, which reminds me. Does that, uh, does that little Miss Spencer still teach school hereabouts? Caroline Spencer? Hmm. Indeed she does. You'll find her quite changed, poor dear. She hasn't really been very sprightly since her visitor arrived. What visitor? Well, why don't you run along and see for yourself? She's had a visitor for long? Oh, longer than she expected. No question about that. Uh, frankly, Lawrence, I think it's an imposition. She's quite a changed person now. Lives most abominably, and all to accommodate her visitor. Looks ten years older than she should. A great pity. Caroline.
Brian Spencer did appear ten years older, and it had been only five. When I arrived the next day at about two, it was at a drab little house at the edge of town. Caroline looked at me as though she wished I hadn't come, and then led me through a hallway up the back stairs to a tiny room which looked out on a small woodshed and two clucking hens. Isn't this a bright, cheery room? Ah, uh, yes, yes, lovely. I didn't expect to see you ever again. Well, I waited for you over there to come back, but you never came. Waited? Where? At the old French port. La Havre. Remember? Yes. I remember that day. How have you been, Larry? You remembered my name. I never forgot it. Caroline, have I come here today at a bad time? Do I inconvenience you? Perhaps two in the afternoon is the wrong time. No, no, not you. No, no, no. Well, again, again, you're in distress. <laughs> what have I said? Oh. Please. <laughs> Please, Caroline, take your hands away from your face. It's because... <laughs> it's because you remind me... Remind you? Oh, you mean that... Miserable day in La Havre. Oh, don't say that, please. It wasn't miserable. It was wonderful. I, you know, I can't tell you how it felt going back the next morning to the inn and finding that you had retreated and to see the boat sailing away with you on it. Oh, can we not talk about that? And you've been here ever since? Yes, ever since. I hope at least your cousin repaid you that money. Oh, I don't care for it now. You don't? care for your money? For going to Europe anymore. It's all over. Everything's different. I never think of it. <sighs> the scoundrel never repaid you. Please, then. please. Don't... Oh, pardon, ma chère. I didn't know you had company. The gentleman came in so quietly. We didn't wish to disturb you in the garden. I know how much you like your afternoon nap. Oh, I have only interrupted to speak of my café. Will you bring it to me, please, under the little quince tree? I'll bring you your coffee. <sighs> C'est bien. And don't forget again, you know. <laughs> Bonjour, monsieur. Well, who in the world is that? It's getting a little close in here. Do you mind if I open the window? I, I don't, usually, because of the hands. <laughs> there. Caroline. Isn't this your own house? Oh, yes, I bought it. Well, then, without trying to be funny about those hens, why are you cooped up in this little room over the hen house? Oh. Surely, surely there must be other rooms in your own house. Oh, yes, there are. But she has them. You mean the person who just ordered coffee? That is la comtesse, as they call her in France. My cousine. I told you about her that day, the letter she wrote me, remember? Oh, Cousin George's wife. Yes, disowned by her own family for marrying George. Uh-huh. And where is he? George is dead. Oh, I'm sorry. And what happened to your money? I don't know. And wasn't there supposed to be a baby? Oh, she never talks about it. I see. So on her husband's death, she came over here to live with you. Yes, she just arrived one day for a visit. How long ago? Two years and four months. She's been here ever since? Ever since. Will you excuse me? I'd better go and get the Countess's coffee. There's no one else to do it? No one but me. I do it every day at this time. You go out into the garden. Talk French to her, would you? Please, Larry. And I'll bring the coffee along. Well, can't she wait on herself? Well, uh, she isn't used to manual labor. <laughs> I see. And you are. Hand and foot, no doubt. Her family is of the oldest Provencal nobility. Oh, sure. I could see it written all over her. Now, please, Larry, don't spoil everything. Go outside. I'll be there in ten minutes. <laughs> Seated under a tree was this woman posing as a countess, living off Carolyn Spencer. As I walked across the grass toward her, I knew in an instant all about her. How 
plump, dead white face, vulgar and common as any person from the streets of Paris. Monsieur? Monsieur? Oh, bonjour, madame. Ah, bonjour. Please uh, be comfortable on the grass, monsieur. Unfortunately, there is only uh, one chair. Ah, Salamet a gal, madame. It makes no difference to me. Oh, I knew you could speak French. To think I would end in a foreign country here, an exile. My family drove me away. Oh, you get used to it, but some things, no. For example, my coffee. All I ask is a little cup after breakfast. I see, and when do you have? breakfast. At noon, as I always did. And the coffee is the last straw. I ask so little. A cup of black coffee with a drop of cognac. My cousine is charmante, but she cannot understand the habit of a lifetime. Every day I say to her, don't forget the drop of cognac. Well, let me go back into the house and see if I can rush things along. Caroline? Caroline, where are you? In the kitchen. Oh, I've forgotten where I left the tray. I'm, I'm so nervous these days. Oh, the coffee is boiling over on no, the stove. No, it has to boil like that and get black or she won't drink it. Caroline, don't you see what she's doing? You've got to stop letting people walk all over you. Oh, people only walk on me because I want them to. What? Uh, bring me that small cup and... Uh, Oh, well, that one's dirty. I'll get one from the shelf up here. Uh, Caroline, look out. The pan of coffee is spilling. Ah! Oh, my, oh, my goodness. It's all over you. Oh. Well, where's the butter? Butter? Yes. Uh, do, you, do you have any butter in the kitchen to put on your hand and wrist to stop the burns? <laughs> strength has all left me. I, I, I don't know what to do next with my life. Caroline. Caroline, what do you want to do? I don't care anymore. That's it. If, if only I could start my life over. Well, I'm afraid no one can do that. I think you're the only person I've ever known, Larry, who didn't cheat me somehow. Even Cousin George? Oh, I... I suspected he wasn't what he made himself out to be, but... I thought it was wicked to be suspicious. And his wife? She doesn't seem to behave like someone of noble birth, does she? <laughs> Perhaps I just don't know Europeans, but... Well, she's all I've got now. What else is there left for me? I've been cheated and made use of. My life is absolutely worthless. Is that what you tell your little students? Caroline, why must life be worthless? Why do you let people walk all over you? Are, are you afraid of life? Afraid? Why all this make-believe? Making yourself believe that by taking care of this vulgar, pretentious creature who happened to marry your cousin George, that this is Europe. That with her in the house, sipping your coffee, you're in a cafe at La Havre. It's no such thing. Now, why do you fool yourself like this, Caroline? Life hasn't cheated you. You've cheated yourself. Is that what I'm doing? You, of all people, an intelligent, sensitive, educated woman. Caroline, get on. Get on with your own life. Live it. Not vicariously. Experience it firsthand. Oh, I'm so ashamed, Larry. You, you should be. Uh, now, you must make that trip. And more than one. You owe it not only to yourself, but to all the little ones in your classes. Just think, think what you could tell them, what you've seen with your own eyes. How's your hand? I feel much better. Good. Then you cook up some more black coffee and I'll go out and tell the widow, George, it's on the way. Monsieur, whatever has happened to that wretched girl and my coffee? There was a slight accident in the kitchen. Miss Spencer burned her hand. Oh, no wonder... Clumsy little fool. Oh, ah, ma chère belle. My morning coffee. Uh, hold the train near to me, ma petite. I do hate reaching for things, you know. Ah, it smells delicious. Now, to taste. Mm. Mm. 
no, 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 no. Mademoiselle Caroline, what would your cousin George say? You have again forgotten in my coffee a drop of cognac. I didn't forget, Berta. I merely decided, since this was the very last cup I should ever again serve you, I brought it the way I prefer it. Incroyable. What? You see, Berta, I have several plans for myself, and they do not include you. Right now, Mr. Stamford and I are taking a ride into town, a pleasant airing. We are. Decidedly. And when I return, Berta, it will be to pick up your luggage and yourself and take you to the train. But, ma chérie, where should I go? The train goes to Boston, and from there you may take the boat back to your beloved Paris. Au revoir. Goodbye, Berta. Was it common sense or the urging of a friend that caused the final turning of Caroline Spencer? The unfathomable and mysterious ways of man's behavior never cease to confound us. And as Byron himself said, never take a female's actions for granted. I shall rejoin you shortly. not read the Aspern papers, Daisy Miller, the Bostonians, and the hundreds of great short stories by Henry James? And who hasn't been horrified and hypnotized by the turn of the screw? In the countless volumes of this master writer, there is story upon story of man against evil, none the least of which is man himself. We hope the next time the name Henry James appears on our program listing that you will not fail to join us on Mystery Theater. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Larry Haynes, Ray Owens, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.